All right, well, I'll, I'll start by saying it's, it's really great to be here in person for a change and great to see people. So um, I, I like Zoom, but this is much better. So uh, do come by after and say hi. It's, I think that's the best part of this whole thing. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges that we're faced with uh, in the industry first. Uh, in, in particular, when we're designing new systems. So the challenge with increasing memory capacity is really twofold. First, it's becoming increasingly difficult for us to increase the density of DRAM due to some of the scaling challenges that we've been facing, which means it's ultimately taking longer to increase the capacity points. Also, if you look at the price per gigabit over time, uh, it's really flattened out on average in the, in the more recent years. And the implication of this is really the second challenge. As memory is an increasingly large portion of a server's cost and power consumption, and that ultimately affects the TCO uh, in a negative fashion, both at the system as well as the rack level. Finally, as the memory speeds have been increasing, uh, we can install less DIMMs per channel as well. So that really helps uh, limits the system capacity further uh, since we have less DIMM slots that we can populate. So if uh, over the past nine years or so, uh, CPU performance has steadily increased with every CPU generation. Uh, but a lot of that improvement has been driven by core count increases. So if you look at the core count here, which is uh, the green line on the chart, um, it's more than tripled over this time frame. On the other hand, if you look at the memory bandwidth per channel, it's roughly doubled in that same time frame. So it's not really kept uh, pace with the, the core count growth. The result is basically that the memory bandwidth per channel uh, that's available per core has decreased over time. And that's what's represented here by the red line. So uh, we do need to keep all of these CPU cores fed because otherwise they're not particularly uh, well utilized. So we have to find a way to scale that bandwidth uh, in some other way. The side effect is that we end up having to add more and more memory channels to our platforms. And we've gone from four channels per socket to six to eight and so on um, and uh, over the past few generations. Finally, the other side effect of more cores is that we need more memory capacity per server as well. And so we have to scale up capacity at the same time. But now that we've talked a little bit about some of the memory uh, trends themselves, we should also look at application trends a little bit as well. Um, uh, much has been said about the rapid growth in AI, uh, and I'm sure you've heard that everywhere these days, but let's take a slightly closer look. So, our projections show that for some of the machine learning models that we've been working with, we expect to see up to a 50x growth in the model capacity over the next five years alone. So as we have to retain these models close to the compute, because there's a lot of uh, requirements around the latency of the operations for those particular models, as really putting a tremendous amount of pressure on memory subsystem designs for future servers, and it really means that we have to think about this a little differently. We can't continue to take the same type of memory uh, subsystem design approach that we have in the past. So uh, CMAC touched on uh, CXL, but I'll give you the, the very short version here. Um, so basically, uh, CXL is Compute Express Link, if you're not familiar with it. Um, CXL is an open industry standard, defined uh, set of protocols and interfaces. And that basically provides high bandwidth, low latency, and coherency on an interconnect. So for the first time, this is going to allow us to pull memory controllers out of the CPU and uh, not only attach other types of media, but also scale uh, in different ways than we've done so in the past. It's built on top of the PCIe Express physical layer, which allows us to scale uh, CXL in the same ways that we're able to scale PCIe. So we can scale with the uh, link speed increases that we get from PCIe, so Gen 4, Gen 5, Gen 6, and so on, um, as well as with the link widths themselves. So we can go by 4, by 8, by 16, and so on. Finally, it allows us to build systems with common slots that can either support PCIe or CXL, and those are auto-negotiated depending on the device that's installed at boot time. 
that's super useful from a system implementer uh, 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 perspective as we're basically able to build a hardware platform and then we can mix and match different configurations as different workloads require. So rather than just talking about it, if you guys actually want to see CXL in action in hardware, I would strongly encourage you guys to come by our booth uh, in the expo hall. We have a demo up and running of CXL, in particular CXL memory. So if you want to check it out, um, please do come by and take a look. So CXL, is real. CXL is real. That's right. <laughs> All right. Now that we've talked about some of the trends uh, that are pushing us to rethink memory tiers, let's take a look at the requirements for, uh, for th that's driving some of this. First, uh, we need to treat these tiers as memory. So from a software allocation and usage perspective, and also from a latency perspective, we don't want to rewrite applications every time we have a new memory tier. So even if we're extending DRAM, latency needs to be within two to five X of DRAM latency typically uh, for us to make the most of it. Second, we need to be able to read or update small chunks of data. Um, and those are roughly cache line sized. Third, these trends are unlikely to reverse, so we need to think uh, about something that can continue to scale both bandwidth and capacity in the future while still remaining efficient from a TCO perspective. Fourth, we need to move away from homogeneous memory subsystems to tiers that have different types of memory characteristics so that we can better mix and match uh, memory tiers to the actual workload requirements. I think I've heard that said a couple of times today, in fact, where it's very difficult to design uh, common uh, hardware platforms that work for all workloads. So having that degree of flexibility here is really going to help us uh, achieve the ultimate utilization that we're looking for. Finally, we need to be focused on standardized interfaces, uh, which really helps us improve adoption rate, uh, development efficiency, um, and also, honestly, enable multi-sourcing. Especially in today's supply chain constrained environments, that's more and more important. So we believe that CXL memory tiers will not only help us fill the gap between directly attached uh, DRAM, um, but that it will also allow us to build multiple tiers uh, for different types of use cases like I, I was just referring to. So we've taken to calling these two types of tiers as, as bandwidth memory and capacity memory as a simple way of organizing some thoughts around these tiers. So next I'll describe some of the characteristics of those tiers in a little bit more detail. So I'll start with the memory bandwidth tier. So the bandwidth tier is primarily focused on providing additional relatively low latency, but fairly high bandwidth memory. So that for applications that are bandwidth bound, for example, we can scale up that bandwidth uh, as is necessary. So the initial target use cases for this are uh, for things like warm pages, compressed pages, or to enable uh, kernel-based page migration. Um, that's an effort that we've spent a significant amount of time on the past six months or so, and uh, we fully expect there's going to be a lot of excellent work that happens in, uh, uh, in, page, in the page migration space within Linux. So the bandwidth per gigabyte here is expected to be lower than DDR5, but not dramatically lower. So maybe roughly similar to DDR4 uh, from a relative perspective. Um, latency needs to be at or equal to NUMA level latency. So think about it from uh, if you're accessing socket one memory on a socket zero CPU, roughly on that order of magnitude is what we've seen tends to work reasonably well for this type of memory so far. So our approach in uh, this particular implementation is to leverage standard register DIMMs uh, for the memory itself and then attach those uh, to this memory expander piece of silicon, um, which may sit on an expansion card, it may sit on the motherboard, but conceptually it's a chip that's down on a board with uh, DIMM slots attached to it. Um, and the benefit there is that uh, we're able to use uh, well understood, well known, robust uh, registered DIMMs uh, from different suppliers and um, yeah, so we can, we can leverage that and then also get the scaling effect that we get from uh, increasing capacity on a per DIM basis at the same time. So the next tier uh, is what we're referring to as the capacity memory tier. 
And the capacity memory tier is really uh, focused on providing much larger memory footprints while trading off some bandwidth per gigabyte and some latency as a side effect. So the initial types of workloads that we're targeting for this are uh, primarily caching tiers. So things like memcache uh, are a good example of this. Um, uh, Manoj just talked a little bit in the morning about cache lib. Um, that's a great way for us to plug in this type of memory, for example, into some of the existing applications. And the other one is really machine learning inference and training. So I talked about the model growth earlier, and this is exactly where we believe this applies very well. So while we can trade some bandwidth and latency here, we do expect to get something for that. Um, at the end of the day, we are still trying to build balanced and efficient systems. So uh, we do expect to see some better bandwidth, I mean, uh, better power per gigabyte as well as uh, cost per gigabyte as a side effect. So we expect that to be on the order of about half of uh, what you might get out of a DDR5-based system. Um, for this tier, we also expect that uh, likely uh, CXL modules in the form of a hot pluggable form factor, for example, things, for example something like an E1S, uh, if you're familiar with that, uh, might be a good way for us uh, to attach this type of memory. And we do expect this to scale into multi-terabyte terabyte, uh, per module over time. Uh, to really keep pace with that growth that I was talking about earlier for the AI models as an example. So the other thing we need to think about is not just from a memory tiering perspective, but what could the evolution with CXL memory look like over time? So for, ta for today, uh, we are intentionally laser focused on building direct attached solutions. Um, so that, so basically that we can build the memory tiers that we just talked about, but we can do so both quickly, efficiently, and to see a max earlier point, it needs to be robust, right? If we're going to build these things at scale, it needs to be able to handle that. And so it needs to be a truly solid building block. There's a lot of ecosystem components, and I, CMAC did touch on a number of those earlier, in fact, uh, that need to be built, right? So the, that includes things like kernel updates, management software, uh, error handling flows, out-of-band management, security and RAS features, uh, and so on. By focusing on the direct attach piece first, uh, it really allows us to build all of those components and build them to, build, to work robustly at the scales that we're talking about. So the next evolution of this is once we have this solid Lego block that we can start from, is to take this to a small-scale memory pools with some smaller number of hosts connected to it. So CMAC was talking about local disaggregation, for example. I think this is a perfect example of, of that definition there. I think those, those uh, work very well. Um, and this really allows us to focus not only on the required hardware components to make that work, uh, because they don't exist today, but also work through some of the challenges that you get from pooling, right? So you have to start working through things around multi-porting. You have to work on quality of service. You have to work on isolation. Um, and uh, allocation mechanisms and all those types of things that you have to really think through once you start getting to a pooled application. And finally, we expect to expand that from there into rack level memory pools. So I'll leave you with a few final thoughts. First, both uh, CXL and the memory tiers still have a significant amount of work that we need to work through, right? This is all still new, new technology, um, and really the best way to do that is to work on this uh, through collaboration between all of us in this room, through OCP, collaboration at CXL. Um, it, it's, it's pretty much core to making this successful in the long run. Second, for this to work, we need to think through the integration of these components uh, both at the system level as well as integration in the software. At the end of the day, if, if we can't integrate properly in the software, uh, it, it's, it's just uh, a silicon solution. We don't actually have something that we can go deploy at scale, for example. And then finally, we believe there is no one-size-fits-all answer. And that at the end of the day, uh, for memory tiers, we're going to have multiple use cases. And we're better, we're better able to efficiently serve those use cases by actually building multiple tiers. So don't think of this as, oh, there's this one monolithic CXL memory solution. The answer is no. In fact, 
I think we're better served by creating uh, multiple variants there. And uh, I described two today with the bandwidth memory and the uh, capacity memory um, as two examples of that. So with that, thank you very much for your time today.